Well, hey guys, and welcome back for a little more uh, reading and reflection here on uh, Remote Wednesday. Um, Today, we're going to read from a familiar text. If you've taken Maine Fish and Wildlife, we're going to read from Aldo Leopold's The Sand County Almanac, um, my, my favorite book of all time. And this may just be my favorite short story from the book. Uh, you know, it brings back so many memories as a kid of, uh, of uh, splitting wood and having wood heat at my house and thinking about where that heat comes from and uh, really thinking about... Um, how trees act as time capsules, you know, and, and we're going, we're studying dendrochronology right now, and it fits perfectly uh, with, with this uh, good story here, Good Oak from a Sand County Almanac. So follow along with me here, we'll read this, and then you guys will do a short reflection for me and be good to go. So, there are two spiritual dangers in not owning a farm. One is the danger of supposing that breakfast comes from the grocery, and the other that heat comes from the furnace. Right off the bat, Aldo coming in with a deep, thought right there right two spiritual dangers in not owning a farm one that you suppose breakfast comes from the grocery and that heat comes from the furnace and uh what he's getting at is kind of modern cultures disconnect with where our food and heat comes from and remember he wrote this in the early 1900s pretty uh prophetic for you know a hundred years later how how much more true that's become To avoid the first danger, one should plant a garden, preferably where there is no grocer to confuse the issue. To avoid the second, he should lay a split of good oak on the andirons, preferably where there is no furnace, and let it warm his shins while a February blizzard tosses the trees outside. If one has cut, split, hauled, and piled his own good oak and let his mind work the while, he will remember much about where the heat comes from and with a wealth of detail denied to those who spend the weekend in town astride a radiator. He's saying if you put in all that work, cutting and splitting and hauling that wood, uh, you get a much greater appreciation for your heat than uh, just sitting next to the radiator. The particular oak now aglow on my andirons grew on the bank of the old emigrant road where it climbs the sand hill. The stump, which I measured upon felling the tree, was a diameter of 30 inches. It shows 80 growth rings. Hence, the seedling from which it originated must have laid its first ring of wood in 1865 at the end of the Civil War. But I know from the history of present seedlings that no oak grows above the reach of rabbits without a decade or more of getting girdled each winter and re-sprouting during the following summer. Indeed, it is all too clear that every surviving oak is the product of either rabbit negligence or of rabbit scarcity. Someday, some patient botanist will draw a frequency curve of oak birth years and show that the curve humps every 10 years, each hump originating from a low in the 10-year rabbit cycle. A fauna and flora, by its very process of perpetual battle within and among species, achieve collective immortality. So what he's getting at there is he, he counts 80 years of growth on his oak. He's dating it back to 1865, but he knows that this oak must be a little older than that because no tiny oaks in his area uh, get a free shot at growth. They all get chewed on by rabbits for a few years before they make it big enough uh, for the rabbits to leave them alone. It is likely then that a low in rabbits occurred in the middle 60s when my oak began to lay on annual rings, but that the acorn that produced it fell during the preceding decade when the covered wagons were still passing over my road into the great northwest. It may have been the wash and wear of the emigrant traffic that barred this road bank and thus enabled this particular acorn to spread its first leaves to the sun. Only one acorn in a thousand ever grew large enough to fight rabbits. The rest were drowned at birth in the prairie sea. It is a warming thought that this one wasn't and thus lived to garner 80 years of June sun. It is this sunlight that is now being released through the intervention of my axe and saw to warm my shack and my spirit through 80 gusts of blizzard. I am not going to lie to you. Every time I have a campfire in my yard with, with my kids and I burn, you know, some good oak that came right from my backyard, I can't help but think about 80 years of June sun, that warmth we feel hitting us, uh, just being that sun's warmth stored in that wood for a long period of time. And with each gust, a wisp of smoke from my chimney bears witness to whomsoever it may concern that the sun did not shine in vain. My dog does not care where the heat comes from, but he cares ardently that it come, and soon. Indeed, he considers my ability to make it come as something magical. For when I rise in the cold black pre-dawn and kneel shivering by the hearth making a fire, he pushes himself blandly between me and the kindling splits I have laid on the ashes, and I must touch a match to them by poking it between his legs. Such faith, I suppose, is the kind that moves mountains. It was a bolt of lightning that put an end to the wood-making by this particular oak. We were all awakened one night in July by the thunderous crash. We realized that the bolt must have hit nearby, but since it did not hit us, we all went back to sleep. 
Man brings all things to the test of himself, and this is notably true of lightning. What a, what a cool observation and such a true statement there, right? We bring all things uh, to the test of ourselves. They woke up, said, eh, I'm alive, I'm good, went back to sleep. They weren't worried about, uh, you know, what happened outside. Next morning, as we strolled over the sand hill, rejoicing with the cone flowers and the prairie cl- clovers over their fresh accession of rain, we came upon a great slab of bark freshly torn from the trunk of the roadside oak. The trunk showed a long spiral scar of barkless sapwood, a foot wide and not yet yellowed by the sun. By the next day, the leaves had wilted, and we knew that the lightning had bequeathed to us three cords of prospective fuel wood. We mourned the loss of the old tree, but knew that a dozen of its progeny standing straight and stalwart on the sands had already taken over its job of wood making. We let the dead veteran season for a year in the sun it could no longer use, and then on a crisp winter's day we laid a newly filed saw to its bastion base. Fragrant little chips of history spewed from the saw cut and accumulated on the snow before each kneeling sawyer. We sensed that these two piles of sawdust were something more than wood, that they were the integrated transect of a century, that our saw was biting its way stroke by stroke, decade by decade, into the chronology of a lifetime, written in concentric annual rings of good oak. That paragraph right there is deep, right? Right off the bat, he calls he calls uh, wood chips fragrant little chips of history. I love it, right? To him, cutting through this oak tree, every annual ring he cuts through, he's thinking about the year and what was happening in human history as that oak stood there making a growth ring. And that's what he's going to get at here next. He's going to name off all these years that they're cutting through and think about what was going on around this tree as it was making that wood. Um, Keep in mind they're cutting this with a, with a buck saw. So there's a guy on each end of this saw and they're pulling it back and forth to cut this tree down. This is a long time ago, right? It took only a dozen pulls of the saw to transect the few years of our ownership, during which we had learned to love and cherish this farm. Abruptly, we began to cut the years of our predecessor, the bootlegger, who hated this farm, skinned it of its residual fertility, burned its farmhouse, threw it back into the lap of the county with delinquent taxes to boot, and then disappeared among the landless anonymities of the Great Depression. Yet the oak had laid down good wood for him. His sawdust was as fragrant, as sound, and as pink as our own. An oak is no respecter of persons. The reign of the bootlegger ended sometime during the Dust Bowl droughts of 1936, 34, 33, and 30. Oak smoke from his still and peat from burning marshlands must have clouded the sun in those years, and alphabetical conservation was abroad in the land. But the sawdust shows no change. Rest, cries the chief sawyer, and we pause for breath. Now our saw bites into the 1920s, the Babidian decade, when everything grew bigger and better in heedlessness and arrogance until 1929, when stock markets crumpled. If the oak heard them fall, its wood gives no sign, nor did it heed the legislature's several protestations of love for trees, a national forest and a forest crop law in 1927, a great refuge on the upper Mississippi bottomlands in 1924, and a new forest policy in 1921. Neither did it notice the demise of the state's last Martin in 1925, nor the arrival of its first starling in 1923. That's an invasive bird. In March 1922, the big sleet tore the neighboring elms limb from limb, but there is no sign of damage to our tree. What is a ton of ice more or less to a good oak? Rest, cries the chief Sawyer, Sawyer and we pause for breath. So over and over again here, he's going to reiterate how all these things in conservation history are happening, but the oak takes no notice and just keeps doing its oak thing. And it's cool to think about that, right? Especially nowadays in the world we live in, how crazy it can feel and how wild it seems out there in our society. And just think about those trees. They're just out there being a tree, doing their thing, right? Making a growth ring every year. That's what they're up to. Now that the saw bites into 1910 through 20, the decade of the drainage dream when steam shovels sucked dry the marshes of central Wisconsin to make farms and made ash heaps instead. Our marsh escaped, not because of any caution or forbearance among engineers, but because the river floods at each April and, and did so with a vengeance, perhaps a defensive vengeance in the years 1913 through 16. The oak laid on wood just the same, even in 1915 when the Supreme Court abolished the state forest and Governor Phillip pontificated that state forestry is not a good business proposition. It did not occur to the governor that there might be more than one definition of what is good and even of what is business. It did not occur to him that while the courts were writing one definition of goodness in the law books, fires were writing quite another one on the face of the land. Perhaps to be a governor, one must be free from doubt on such matters. So what he's getting at there is they canceled the state forestry program and instead of harvesting wood, they left it out there and a lot of it burned in massive forest fires rather than uh, being harvested, which would prevent the forest fires and provide uh, materials for people. 
While forestry receded during this decade, game conservation advanced. In 1916, pheasants became successfully established in Waukesha County. In 1915, a federal law prohibited spring shooting. In 1913, a state game farm was started. In 1912, a buck law protected female deer. In 1911, an epidemic of refuges spread over the state. Refuge become, became a holy word, but the oak took no heed. Rest, cries the chief Sawyer, and we pause for breath. So he's working his way back in time, right? If we picked up on that, as he's cutting through this tree, each drawer of the saw, they're going back in time, cutting the next growth ring. They're going back uh, towards the, the uh, pith year of this tree. Now we cut 1910 when a great university president published a book on conservation. A great sawfly epidemic killed millions of tamaracks. A great drought burned the pinneries and a great dredge drained Horican Marsh. We cut 1909 when smelt were first planted in the Great Lakes and when a wet summer induced the legislature to cut the forest fire appropriations. We cut 1908, a dry year when the forest burned fiercely and Wisconsin parted with its last cougar. We cut 1907 when a wandering lynx looking in the wrong direction for the promised land ended his career among the farms of Dane County. We cut 1906 when the first state forester took office and fires burned 17,000 acres in these sand counties. We cut 1905 when a great flight of goshawks came out of the north and ate up the local grouse. They no doubt perched in this tree to eat some of mine. We cut 1902 through 3, a winter of bitter cold. 1901, which brought the most intense drought of record. Rainfall only 17 inches. 1900, a centennial year of hope, of prayer, and the usual annual ring of oak. I love that, right? 1900 to us would have been a, a crazy year, right? A centennial year to an oak, just another year. Rest, cries the chief Sawyer, and we pause for breath. Now our saw bites into the 1890s, called gay by those whose eyes turned cityward rather than landward. We cut 1899 when the last passenger pigeon collided with a charge of shot near Babcock, two counties to the north. We cut 1898 when a dry fall followed by a snowless winter froze the soil seven feet deep and killed the apple trees. 1897, another drought year, when another forestry commission came into being. 1896, when 25,000 prairie chickens were shipped to market from the village of Spooner alone. 1895, another year of fires. 1894, another drought year. And 1893, the year of the bluebird storm, when a March blizzard reduced the migrating bluebirds to near zero. The first bluebirds always alighted in this oak, but the middle 90s must have gone without. We cut 1892, another year of fires. 1891, a low in the grouse cycle. And 1890, the year of the Babcock milk tester, which enabled Governor Heil to boast half a century later that Wisconsin is America's dairy land. The motor licenses, which now parade that, boast were then not foreseen, even by Professor Babcock. It was likewise in 1890 that the largest pine rafts in history slipped down the Wisconsin River in full view of my oak to build an empire of red barns for the cows of the prairie state. Thus, it is that good pine now stands between the cow and the blizzard, just as good oak stands between the blizzard and me. Oh my God! Goodness, is that deep, right? He's talking about, uh, what year was that? 1890, when a giant raft of pine logs came down the Wisconsin River within view of this oak tree. And he's guessing that, uh, you know, the oak tree, you know, they, they floated right by this oak tree as it was growing there on the banks of the Wisconsin River. And now he says um, that good pine stands between the cow and the blizzard because all those pine... Uh, logs were used to build barns all over the Midwest. So good pine stands between the, the cow and the blizzard, just as good oak stands between the blizzard and him, right? Rest cries the chief Sawyer, and we pause for breath. They're, so over and over again, they're, they're pausing to catch their breath because it's hard work using this buck saw to cut down this giant tree. Now our saw bites into the 1880s, into 1889, a drought year in which Arbor Day was first proclaimed, into 1887 when Wisconsin appointed its first game wardens, into 1886 when the College of Agriculture held its first short course for farmers, into 1885 preceded by a winter of unprecedented length and severity, into 1883 when Dean W.H. Henry reported that the spring flowers at Madison bloomed 13 days later than average, into 1882 the year Lake Mendota opened a, a month late following historic big snow and bitter cold of 1881 too. It was likewise in 1881 that Wisconsin Agricultural Society debated the question, how do you account for the second growth of black oak timber that has sprung up all over the country in the last 30 years? My oak was one of these. One debater claimed spontaneous generation. Another claimed regurgitation of acorns by southbound pigeons. Rest, cries the chief Sawyer, and we pause for breath. 
So what they're getting at there is what used to be prairie was becoming forest. There were oak trees coming up everywhere and nobody knew why. Uh, people thought that it was just random, spontaneous tree growth. Other people thought pigeons were regurgitating acorns as they migrated. The real answer was likely that we had wiped out bison herds that naturally essentially mowed the, hairy, the prairies and kept them grass. And uh, without bison um, keeping the, them grazed down, the prairies reverted to forest. Now our saw bites the 1870s, the decade of Wisconsin's carousel and wheat. Monday morning came in 1879 when, when cinch bugs, grubs, rust, and soil exhaustion finally convinced Wisconsin farmers that they could not compete with the virgin prairies further west in the game of weeding land to death. I suspect that this farm played its share in the game and that the sand blow just north of my oak had its origin in overweeding. So what he's getting at there is uh, farming the same crop over and over again on, on the same ground can really deplete the soil and really remove topsoil and turn it to just sand. And that's what happened in a lot of uh, Wisconsin from unsustainable farming methods way back in the day. This same year of 1879 saw the first planting of carp in Wisconsin and also the first arrival of quack grass as a stowaway from Europe. On 27 October 1879, six migrating prairie chickens perched on the roof tree of the German Methodist Church in Madison and, and took a look at the growing city. On 8th of November, the markets at Madison were reported to be glutted with ducks at 10 cents each. At 1878, a deer hunter from Sauk Rapids remar remarked prophetically, the hunters promised to outnumber the deer. On the 10th September of 1877, two brothers shooting Muskego Lake bagged 210 blue wing teal in one day. In 1876 came the wettest year of record. The rainfall piled up 50 inches. Prairie chickens declined, perhaps owing to hard rains. In 1875, four hunters killed 153 prairie chickens at York Prairie, one county to the eastward. In the same year, the U.S. Fish Commission planted Atlantic salmon in Devil's Lake, 10 miles south of my oak. In 1874, the first factory made barbed wire was stapled to my oak trees. I hope no such artifacts are buried in the oak now under saw. In 1873, one Chicago firm received and marketed 25,000 prairie chickens. The Chicago trade collectively bought 600,000 at $3.25 a dozen. In 1872, the last wild Wisconsin turkey was killed, two counties to the southwest. It is appropriate that the decade ending with pioneer carousal and wheat should likewise have ended the pioneer carousal in pigeon blood. In 1871, within a 50-mile triangle spreading northwestward from my oak, 136 million pigeons are estimated to have nested, and some may have nested in it, for it was then a thrifty sapling 20 feet tall. So on this page here, he's laying out all these disastrous uh, over-harvests and horrible, um, you know, uh, um, uses of wildlife back in the late 1800s we were feeding the masses with wildlife and it was really unsustainable and some of the numbers he's laying out there are just crazy to think about pigeon hunting by scores plied their trade with net and gun club and salt lick and train loads of prospective pigeon pie moved southward and eastward toward the cities it was the last big nesting in wisconsin and nearly the last in any state this same year 1871 brought other evidence of the march of the empire the pastigo fire which cleared a couple of counties of trees and soil and the chicago fire said to have started from the protesting the pr protesting kick of a cow in 1870, the meadow mice had already staged their march of empire. They ate up the young orchards of the young state and then died. They did not eat my oak, whose bark was already too tough and thick for mice. It was likewise in 1870 that a market gunner boasted in the American sportsman of killing 6,000 ducks in one season near Chicago. Rest, cries the chief sawyer, and we pause for breath. He's, he's talking there briefly about passenger pigeons, too, quite a bit, and those are, which are now extinct. We hunted them to extinction back then in the 1800s. Our saw now cuts the 1860s when thousands died to settle the question, is the man-man community likely to be dismembered? They settled it, but they did not see, nor do we yet see, that the same question applies to the man-land community. What he's getting at here is the Civil War, and that is a deep, deep way to look at it, right? Ten, when thousands died to settle the question, is the man-man community likely to be dismembered? And what he's getting at is uh, we have another conflict coming in our future when we determine whether or not we're going to begin to treat the land with respect as well. This decade was not without its gropings toward the larger issue. In 1867, Increase A. Lapham introduced the State Horticultural Society to offer prizes for forest plantations. In 1866, the last native Wisconsin elk was killed. The saw now severs 1865, the pith year of our oak.
In that year, John Muir offered to buy from his brother, who then owned the home farm 30 miles east of my oak, a sanctuary for the wildflowers that had gladdened his youth. His brother declined to part with the land, but he could not suppress the idea. In 1865, still stands in Wisconsin history as the birth year of mercy for things natural, wild, and free. We have cut the core. Our saw now reverses its orientation in history. We cut backward across the years and outward toward the far side of the stump. At last, there is a tremor in the great trunk. The saw curve suddenly widens. The saw is quickly pulled as the sawyers spring backward to safety. All hands cry, Timber! My oak leans, groans, and crashes with earth-shaking thunder to lie prostrate across the emigrant road that gave it birth. Now comes the job of making wood. The mall rings on steel wedges as the sections of trunk are upended one by one, only to fall apart in fragrant slabs to be corded by the roadside. There's an allegory for historians in the diverse functions of saw, wedge, and axe. The saw works only across the years, which it must deal with one by one in sequence. From each year, the raker teeth pull little chips of fact, which accumulate in the piles called sawdust by woodsmen and archives by historians. Both judge the character of what lies within by the character of the samples thus made visible without. It is not until the transect is completed that the tree falls and the stump yields a collective view of a century. By its fall, the tree attests the unity of hodgepodge called history. So he's saying you got to use a saw across the grain of wood, and that's what reveals the growth rings. The wedge, this is what he's using to split the oak. The wedge, on the other hand, works only in radial splits. A, such a split yields a collective view of all the years at once, or no view at all, depending on the skill with which the plane of the split is chosen. If in doubt, let the section season for a year until a crack develops. We talked about that in class, right? That crack will develop along a medullary ray. Many a hastily driven wedge lies rusting in the woods embedded in unsplittable cross grain. The axe functions only at an angle diagonal to the years and is only for the peripheral rings of recent past. Its special function is to lop limbs for which both saw and wedge are useless. The three tools are requisite to good oak and to good history. These things I ponder as the kettle sings and the good oak burns to red coals on white ashes. Those ashes come spring, will return to the orchard at the foot of the sand hill. They will come back to me again, perhaps as red apples, or perhaps as a spirit of enterprise in some fat October squirrel, or for reasons unknown to himself, is bent on planting acorns. Oh, man, I love that last bit there, right? He's talking about that carbon trapped in those ashes from his oak tree that he's going to spread back in his apple orchard and how that carbon will likely be harnessed by nearby organisms or eventually make it back into the air and work its way back through the biota, back through the living realm. Just deep stuff. And if you've read from Aldo Leopold with me before, you know the guy is just a legend. Um, and if you're new to him, we'll read uh, quite a bit from him this year. This is definitely the longest of all the short stories we'll read. And I appreciate you following along with me through that story. It's just uh, good stuff. And I hope you never sit by a campfire or by your wood stove at home uh, ever again without thinking about those 80, 80 June, the warmth of 80 Junes, uh, you know, bathing you coming off of that wood, where that heat comes from, where, how that energy was stored by that tree harnessing the sun's energy and the work that it takes to get that heat. Your job now is just take a few minutes to write me three to five sentences. Collins, type three. I'm looking for sentences that flow together here. I want you to identify one conservation-based lesson humans could take from this essay. There's a million in there. If you paw through there, you'll find a lot of different examples of really bad stuff people were doing. He's pointing out all along the way mistakes people made in conservation, whether it's over-harvest of, of uh, you know, trees or wildlife constantly through there. Um, there's tons of different lessons to be learned. Identify one passage that relates to your own observations in Maine. How do you personally connect to this? How, you know, as we read through there, was there anything you were connecting with yourself, your own observations? And identify one way in which this passage changed the way you look at the main woods come up with three things for me three to five sentences there a short little paragraph and you're good to go i appreciate you following along with me as we read and uh, doing your work today and i look forward to seeing you guys in class next time